Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another Roll20 review, my written and video view series. We'll take a look at the Marketplace section of online role-playing website, Roll20.net. For this video, I'll be reviewing the 5e conversion system, Esper Genesis, designed by Alligator Alley Entertainment and adapted for Roll20. Review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider supporting me via patreon.com slash Rogue Watson. Shoutouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Manuel, Wizard, Princess, Christopher, Star Loverly, Thomas, Eldugs92, Ian, James, Captain Mike, and Jeremy. And Gold Patrons, RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Marco, State, Vicente, Gilberto, Adam, Deathlizard, Lion, Sam, Arash, Lumpy, Spuds, Drone, Fatboy619, Sklinia, Nick, Party McButterpants, and Blood Angel Baronis. Well, very much for your support. So what is a conversion? That's the terminology I'm using, I guess. Um, Esper Genesis is a... Video game terms would be a total conversion, which is you take a existing game or rule system and leave most of the underlying mechanics intact and just insert whatever your theme, your skin on top of it. And in this case, obviously, it is a sci-fi theme on top of the fantasy world of D&D 5th edition. So this uses all of the original 5e rule sets that most of us are probably familiar now with it being five or six years old by now. Esper Genesis itself is not new, by the way. This actually originally came out back in 2018, uh, I believe on drive Through RPG, but it is uh, now in 2021, officially available on Roll20 through multiple different products. And I'll actually be reviewing several of them with this video, including the core manual, which is just added to the compendium and has all the rules in place, races, classes, all that. The Threats Database, which is basically the monster manual. The Threat Tokens Pack, which is just pretty much select tokens from the, from the Threat Database, just the tokens in the art gallery. And the Fall of the A.S. Kelder Introductory Adventure, which is what you're looking at right now. Mainly as an excuse so I have something to show, because otherwise I'm just talking about rules and looking through the compendium which can still be useful but we also were playing on roll 20 so we can have you know play on maps and move our tokens around and do all that i do have access to the crucible core organized play uh seasons i believe the first two seasons uh were also uh given to me for possible review purposes i'm not reviewing them with this video if you would like me to cover more esper genesis stuff then leave a comment below or hit me up on discord or twitter and let me know if you're interested then I can um, you know, expand my look at Esper Genesis and cover some of that content. But for now, this is going to be uh, my preliminary dive into what this system is, which ultimately I have mixed feelings about. I think um, I, you know, I, I've reviewed sci-fi RPGs in the past. Most recently, Burn Bright, which is available on Roll Twenty, as well as uh, Starfinder before it was available on. Roll20, um, and I think the 5e rule set is a big plus. I really like, obviously, we've been running D&D 5e in our campaigns for years. It's something that me and my players are very familiar with. We enjoy the rule set a lot, and it's a testament to how elegant and flexible 5th edition is that allows it to just use a completely different theme and still work very, very well and function pretty much exactly how you would expect it if you're coming from D&D. On the flip side of that is it doesn't really feel all that different than just playing D&D with like, you know, instead of swinging a sword, I'm swinging a laser sword. Instead of firing a crossbow, I'm firing a blaster. And it, there's just, it doesn't quite do enough to change things and make it more interesting. And I realize this is a tough thing to do because on the one hand, you want to make it fully compatible with 5e and want all those players to be able to jump right in. On the other hand, it doesn't do enough on its own. And the biggest, I think, um, criticism I have is the races and classes. The races aren't very interesting, and the classes are just way too analogous to the original 5e classes, to where there's almost like a one-to-one -one ratio between, oh, this class is just literally this class in D&D. They just called it, like, the specialist in this game is is just a rogue and they've got like evasion uncanny dodge they even have sneak attack they just call it like deft strike i mean it's just it's weird it almost becomes just a, a weird knockoff at that point rather than its own system so i wasn't a big fan of that so ultimately i have kind of mixed uh feelings about the whole thing um so with the core manual what you get is the compendium which if you're not familiar with the way 
Roll20 works is you can get um, maps, you know, adventures, which include all of the maps that you're playing on, as well as any tokens that you'll be using, and all of that is going to be found here in the journal. If you get any uh, token packs specifically, those will be found in the art gallery here in the um, marketplace purchases section. And if you're buying any kind of rules type content, whether that's Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, any of that stuff, or any kind of you know monster manual, all of that, that's going to appear in the compendium. Now, the core manual for Esper Genesis is quite good. Um, it's almost unnecessary if you already play 5e because all of that information is pretty much, um, you already know it. Like if you can play, if you can play D&D 5e, you already know how to play Esper Genesis. It is very, very few different rules involved here. It's almost the exact same. It's even organized, uh, pretty much the same as the, uh, player's handbook. It's... I mean, there's, it just, it flips around a few backgrounds, you know, there's some new feats, there's some different uh, powers. Excuse me while I sneeze. Um, obviously, spaceships is a new thing, that's in, that's a new chapter, but even, like, the powers are basically just spells, which it includes the, uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide actually has a spell variant. If you don't want to use spell slots, you can use spell points, and what this system does is it divides their spell system into talents and i believe techniques techniques use tech slots which are just spell slots and then talents use talent points which are just spell points you know so it kind of it just divides it uses that system and then divides it into two different kinds of classes and then classes typically either use the tech slots or the talent points and it's that's fine i mean it's it's fine it works it's just not that different from 5e and I think I think I'd be fine with that element of keeping of dividing up the spells between and I'll actually really like the spell point variant that all works really well the part that bugs me out bums me out are the classes are just way too similar I mean warrior is just a fighter hunter is a ranger uh, sentinel is basically a paladin cybermancer which sounds really cool uh, which they have is like the matrix uh, like the end of the matrix movie where neo just sees everything in lines of code and it's all described as like they can like re you know the world hackers and all this it sounds very very cool they're warlocks they're just warlocks <laughs> they have ta they have fewer uh talent uh points uh which mean or slots i guess they're calling it um which means similar to a warlock where you don't you don't you have fewer spell slots um but you get them back on a short rest and then instead of warlock invocations you have cybermancer complex patterns which uh operate pretty much the exact same as uh, invocations where you get just, you can select them at different levels and you have so many and a lot of them offer you different little abilities and things. It's, you know, I was reading this going, oh, Cybermancer sounds, sounds cool. And I got halfway through it and I was like, oh, you're, it's a warlock. <laughs> you're just a space warlock. You know, especially as a space rogue. It's just, it's, it's disappointing. Um, in terms of the way the manual is organized and structured, it all works very well. Um, again, everything is searchable. So if you already know what you're looking for, they're filtered out by main topics here. And then you can just search for, you know, whatever you need here and it'll pull up uh, any kind of information. Or if you need to actually look at the full manual, uh, then you can do that uh, as well. This actually skips ahead to a section I wanted to look at, which is how the powers and the threats are organized, which is really, really cool. I love this, I guess, UI. Uh, it just looks incredibly nice to be able to search with this and these really sexy drop down menus. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> you can filter them by domain, by range, by uh, their rank, which is their level. You know, prime is a cantrip, for example. And they have these really nice drop down menus uh, that show all the information. That's just a really cool database. So it works. This is uh, available for uh, all of the powers, which again is, is all your spells, basically your space spells. And then for the threats is the same way. Any kind of uh, monster uh, is given the similar treatment. I believe we have to go to you all monsters. We'll do that. Yes. So here you can see, and then you do like the drop down menu and it shows you the stat block right there, which is really awesome. And then if you want to actually look at the creature itself, you would just uh, click on this heading and then you get a full on uh, view of the creature. Scroll up for the token. So the tokens are all included. Um, this is, uh, the adventure, so only the stuff that's included in this adventure, which is the fall of, uh, Eos Kelder is included in this information, which, uh, that was the threat tokens, and then the fall 
uh, or that was the threat database, the core manual. And then the introductory adventure includes uh, four battle maps, uh, including a space map for a starship battle, uh, 12 NPCs, uh, including four named NPCs. All of them have uh, token art as well as the matching stat blocks. You can see here, token looks like, click on character sheet and everything is ready to go. You can just uh, click on any of these buttons and it instantly goes into the uh, chat window there. Also includes four pre-generated characters, which I always like to see for level one introductory adventures. Give me some pre-gen characters as an example to, uh, you know, what the possible characters look like. Uh, a big knock against Esper Genesis right now in Roll20 is that it does not include the character monster. One of the coolest features in Roll20 is the character monster, which means whenever you're making a character, uh, you can go through this whole level up process that kind of works you through all the character creation systems via various tabs and uh, just everything is implemented in like a dialogue window. And it's really, really handy. It's awesome. And if you've got more of the you know, you've got like a Tasha's or a Xanathar's and it has all of those uh, classes included. It's basically very D&D beyond -D And then you can drag things over as you need from the compendium. None of that's available for Esper Genesis yet, which is a bummer because that should have been honestly a day one feature for when this launched. And frankly, this launched, I believe, back in January of 2021. And this I'm reviewing this in March. So I'm a little behind the times on reviewing it. And it still doesn't look like it's available for uh, the character monster. So that is a bit of a thumbs down there because I really like the character monster feature. So that's a shame that it is not included as of yet. Instead, you just have to edit all your things uh, directly and just kind of do your level ups just like you would anything else. Uh, this is what the character sheet looks like, by the way, which is almost exactly like the D&D 5e sheet, except for basically it says Esper Genesis up here. <laughs> That's basically the only difference. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, all the different, uh, in fact, the skills are even very similar. I believe computers is a new one. Mechanics is new and xenobiology, uh, replacing things like religion and maybe, nope, survival's still on there. A few of them might get replaced or added. Astrophysics is also obviously uh, new. Otherwise, you know, you still have passive perception. You've got all your attacks you can include in here. In fact, we'll show you what a uh, the pregen looks like. So you can see one that's filled out. Current hit points, armor class, initiative speed, everything just works. You click on a button here. It instantly goes into the chat window. You can have it to automatically roll damage or not. That's something you can set up. You want to roll a skill. You just click on your skill uh, saving throw. You click on your saves up here. You just want to make a skill check. You click on that one there. You want to look up all your abilities. And you can drag and drop different features as you need them from here, um, which should work. I believe if you wanted to, for example, give this character the acrobat... Uh, feet. See there, you can just drag it right onto here. I took the acrobat feet and it appears on the character sheet. You can click that button actually uh, include it in the chat window or click this to just uh, maximize it. So that's just all standard Roll20 features. That's the advantage of having the compendium, which is that all of this information is available. So for example, all the feats you can drag over. I can do that with spells or weapons, by the way. I can drag over anything that I find um, and include that, let's see, our weapons included in here? Let's include an EMP grenade. And that should, boom, there's an EMP grenade right there. So I just dragged that from the compendium. Huge plus for having that. So all that information is in the core manual, as well as obviously all the content from, uh, you know, the manual itself, uh, which is, let's see, how do we go back to the manual? On the source, uh-oh, page not found. Um, let's go back a step. But it has, I mean, you don't need the manual to run this game. And, and the game comes with this introductory adventure, which is five bucks, I believe, uh, comes with all the information you need to run it. If you're familiar with 5e, then you already know how to do everything. The few different rules that I could discover were the fact that, like, guns have burst fire, which means you can, t instead of doing an attack roll, you turn it into a, opponents have to make a save in that area, like a deck save. Um, there's a little bit about ammunition, but it's not very fiddly or anything. It's not like Shadowrun. Uh, and then one thing is that talent users can enter a limit breach in order to either access their higher level talents or to try to use a talent point that they've already expended, which it seems like a cool, and you could easily do that in D&D too with, a, with spells. It's just, you have to make a either saving throw or skill check in order to even, you know, use those more powerful abilities. So I actually kind of liked that little rule difference. Um, spaceships work really well, I think, uh, you know, compared to something like Starfinder, I found it very, uh, 
uh, easy to follow, you know, the things that you can do. Um, there's a pilot, there's gunners, there's uh, technicians, and everybody has different roles you can make in combat. Um, they're all dictated here in their own chapter. Uh, there's rules about structural integrity and system shock damage and repairing your spaceship. All of that information is here. And the introductory adventure actually ends with a little starship battle, which is a neat little uh, climax. Uh, I also want to talk about the threats database before I go too deep into this. So, I mean, basically the core manual is good. It's fine. It does what it needs to do. Um, it's not super... Because it's based on 5e, it doesn't really provide a whole lot of um, new stuff for you. Uh, oh, you know what I forgot to go over? is The frickin' races. One of my biggest complaints of this entire thing um, is the races are boring. They're real boring. Which, you know, sci-fi races, there's some tropes you can always play on. And then you're always hoping to some exotic, cool stuff. Like, I've played a lot of you know, turn-based, you know, the galactic civilizations and the endless spaces and Stellaris and all those, and you just see all the myriad of really cool, crazy races you can get and still end up with, you know, Ascension uh, Empire, but you, you just all manner of, you know, what the background is, what their physiology is, what their culture is, so many interesting things you can do beyond the realm of, like, standard fantasy races, whether you're basing this on familiar tropes or not. Um, there's just, I'm, I'm really excited to see what Esper Genesis did and I'm disappointed to report that most of them are just kind of like Star Trek humanoids and I don't mean to bash Star Trek fans but like like made for TV like slightly different makeup style uh humanoid uh races <laughs> there's literally two different kinds of like earth humans one of them is just like a genetically engineered human version which is the which are the Prometheans um but essentially just humans um there are obviously humans there's uh, three different races that are just human-like, essentially. The Dendis, the Eldori, and the Kesh. The Kesh are just, like, hairless. The Dendis have, like, tentacle hair. They're, none of them are just particularly... They just remind me of the Star Trek races. They're all just slightly different looking, but ultimately still humanoids, which is why I found it really boring. Ashenforged are your AI, um, kind of like your Warforged uh, from Eberron. The only really different ones are the Matokai, the Valna, and the Belair. The Mat the Matakai are your standard hulking, like, lizard uh, alien race, uh, which feels very tropey for sci-fi, for sure. Uh, and then the other very tropey one they have are the cat people, which is two of the... If you had to choose, like, a bipedal anthropomorphic race that's a classic sci-fi thing, uh, it would be the cat folk and the lizard folk, and that's kind of what we get here. These guys hate technology, although they still begrudgingly use it, and the Matakai are, like, you know, your standard honor warriors, your... Uh, Klingons, I guess. Um, the Belay are the really only truly interesting race. Unfortunately, it says that they are very rare and most, you know, you're not really supposed to be able to play them too often, but they are pure energy beings that exist inside of their own biometric suits, which, of course, for some stupid reason, are mostly looking like humans. <laughs> but at least there's something different. At least they're an all-energy being. So I'll give them that. But for the most part, I was fairly disappointed in the races. Just I, Starfinder, for example, and Burn Bright both had way more interesting races. Burn Bright has the giant robot folks, and they've got like those slugs that can like animate dead corpses and and be the people. Starfinder had like the four-armed, like egg-shaped people. They've got that insectoid race with that huge culture about um, you know being on the hive mind and being broken away from that. Like all of that is just really cool and interesting and made me excited and the little rat folk that like technology uh, excited to play in that world. Whereas this one does not excite me at all. And same thing with the actual like world building didn't really do it for me either compared to Starfinder and Burn Bride. I found both of their universes to be a lot more interesting. The, the big hook here is that everybody's discovered um, these power sources uh, and this uh, material that exists inside of these like spheres and that allows people to basically awaken the almost like X-Men style or something like awaken the powers within them um, and these Esper powers and then if you reach Esper Genesis it means you have achieved and it's called heroic sci-fi role playing so somebody who's achieved Esper Genesis is somebody who's essentially super powered and can access these powers which is where all the player characters come from so even at level one you are considered to be baseline, like more powerful than the average person because you can access that these powers. It's not necessarily a bad thing to do, and I, I like the heroic. That, that's how I play my RPGs is to make my players feel like superheroes. So 
that's not bad, but the story and the universe didn't seem to be much more interesting uh, beyond just explaining like why these player characters are more powerful. So that's kind of my overarching feelings on uh, the Esper Genesis and, and the core manual. Now the threat database is the, uh, mon I guess we'll just go to monsters, is really good. As much as I'm not impressed with the races or the classes, I generally like the monsters. Um, and because they're compatible, fully compatible with 5e, you can check out any one of these monsters and it's a very recognizable, uh, stat block. Uh, if you, you know, are getting familiar with D&D 5th edition, you can check out one of these monsters. We've got a cool, uh, you know, artwork of all of them. You've got a great token, which this one looks blown up there. The tokens do look better. Um, in fact, I can show you, let's, let's see. This is a weird, like washed out screen. Let's go to the space map real quick. This one looks better. If you wanted to bring this into your game, you can literally just drag this over here. It'll pop the window up. Um, and then it should appear. There we go. Boom. And there's your token right on the battle map. And you can do that with whatever uh, adventure you're playing as long as you're playing with the Esper Genesis Compendium. And this is a big problem that I have is that it's marketed as being fully compatible with 5e, which means... You can use this monster, let's look at that stat block since we can actually get that far, in D&D. &D. Like all of these systems, everything, how it works, you know, saving throws, its stats, like every, this is a completely exact carbon copy of what is a D&D &D 5e stat. This is an original creature, obviously, but the way all this system works, like a recharge, all of that is exactly how it works in D&D &D 5e. Here's the weird part. If I were to start up a game of D&D &D and select... Okay, I'm using D&D as my system. I do not have access to any of this stuff. Even if I've purchased it, I don't have access to it. In order to access all the Esper Genesis stuff, I would have to play in the Esper Genesis system. And that bugs me because it says it's fully compatible, so why not just let me mix and match them? Right now, at the time of this review, you cannot do that. The only way, there's a workaround, I had to look at a forum post for this, but the workaround is that you can go into your game settings and you can, have, you can switch your compendiums uh, after you've made your game, and that will change what you have access to on this screen, in this I tab. But, on the other side of that is, it means you don't have access to your D&D stuff. So there's no way to look at both of them together, basically. So you can switch back and forth, you can then drag this creature over there to your, you know, all the creatures you want from uh, Esper Genesis onto there, and then you could switch back to D&D if you wanted to. That is technically a workaround, so that's a way they're compatible, but I really wish there was some way where you could just check a box that says, look, just let's insert this into my game. I want all this, I want all the toys. Just bring that, bring that shit in here because it were it's fully compatible. Like it, it works in there. You can literally just drag this creature over there and boom, we're ready to go. And, and there's some cool creatures in this threat database. Um, some of them are, it's really funny how they use the standard like animals and they use this very odd like constellation looking art just to make it spacey. It's like, here's a space bat, here's a space cat, here's a space ape, here's a space, you know, giant wolf. And it just, that's, you know, maybe over a dozen of those creatures. But then there are some better creatures out there. I was showing you this um, kind of insectoid soldier. There's also a bunch of um, sentient insect soldiers called the Xamarons. Carry blasters. They look really cool, like little wasps. Um, there's a cool, uh, what is it, a giant space shark called the Telvarius. Look at that guy. Friggin' cool. Uh, CR-23, by the way. So there's some really cool, interesting uh, enemies in here. There's giant, like, death robots, um, sentient plants. There's different kinds of... Um, they use a generic planetary beast just because, you know, again, that universe is endless. You can use whatever the fuck you want for any of these things. Um, and it works. It all works very well. I, I think the threat database is cool, but I think it would have been cooler and it would have been a better selling point if you had been able to mix and match those a lot easier. So I want to make sure everybody's aware of that when they're looking at this, thinking as I did, oh man, even if I'm not going to run, you know, Esper Genesis as a sci-fi RPG, I could see myself using the equivalent of its monster manual, the threat database, in my own D&D &D games. And technically vice versa, if you wanted to play Esper Genesis and you wanted to you wanted to land on a fantasy planet and include some, you know, centaurs or shit. Um, you could use those creatures into Esper Genesis. It's, you know, you could literally just bring shit over there. But in order to do that, you would have to go into the compendium of your game settings, switch that around in order to be able to uh, access all of that compendium information. So that's a bummer, but I do think the threat database is very good. 
Um, very few of these creatures, by the way, if you don't have the threat database, um, actually show up. Um, I think, let's see, what's the best way to show that? If we go into rules and we access the, I think I have to access the core manual again, and then it'll show me some sample. Let's see, threat statistics in Appendix B. So here's the list right now. If you only buy the core manual and do not purchase the threat database, uh, which is another $40 purchase, by the way. And again, it's the equivalent of the monster manual. And, and you would I don't think you would ever suggest anybody run a D&D game without the monster manual, unless you were just running like the starter, you know, Lost Mine of Fendover. And I mean, technically all these adventures that have monsters include those monsters. But if you want to at all run your own adventure, then you're going to want this content. But this is the kind of stuff, th th these right here are the only monsters uh, that you will find in the uh, core manual, which is if you look very closely, some of the ones in... Uh, here say, oh, this is rules, my bad. You go to monsters. Uh, some of them have the CM and others have the TD. All the ones that have CM, which is why you see doubles on some, are from the original core manual. And then the threat database, all the which is the TDs, um, added all of the other monsters just on top of here, which means some of them are unfortunately doubled. Instead of replacing it, it just added it in addition to. But there's not a whole lot introduced just in the basic uh, core manual. Now, if you... The, the one other solution is the uh, Threat Token Pack, which uh, Roll20, you can purchase um, tokens which appear in the art library, which that one does not require a compendium change. That one, the art gallery is available for any of your content. You just go to art gallery, you click on my lab library, you click on marketplace purchases, and they're included here. And this includes um, probably about... <sighs> Technically, I think the total number is about half of what's in the threat database, but a lot of the threat database might be like, you know, again, those wolves, those cats, you know, stuff that you don't necessarily care about. This includes most of the cool, unique um, art tokens found in the threat database as a token. And you can drag this, you know, token over here, and it's already there available for. Now, the problem here is this does not include a character sheet. The compendium does include a character sheet. It's already got hit points. It lists the armor class. And if you do the shift double click, it instantly pulls up the character sheet. And the character sheet is tied to the token. If I were to roll initiative, all that stuff works. This thing, which is just the art, is literally just this token. Now, And you can attach whatever character sheet you want to it. It requires a lot of extra work for you on the DM to make this work. But that is technically available for you as a purchaser. of, And this is a lot cheaper than purchasing the threat database, technically. So if you wanted to put in the work yourself, you could just get the threat tokens. That gives you most of the cool-looking art from the database. You would just have to then enter all that actual character sheets and content yourself from what you need, which you can totally do. Roll20 is not going to stop you from doing that. Um, so that is an option as well. All right, now we're finally going to get into... Uh, the fall of, uh, what the hell is this adventure called? <laughs> uh, the fall of the A.S. Kelder, which is the introductory adventure. This one is not included in anything I just mentioned. It's a separate four ninety nine purchase. Um, I believe it's got a sequel also, uh, which is a sequel directly to this adventure. And then the Crucible Core, which is another list of organized play, starts over with its own adventure. So this is its own level one adventure. It is designed for level one players starting out. And I think it does a pretty good job of introducing you to, um, wo uh, the, you know, the spacey themes um, and giving everybody a, an exciting introduction. It is a very combat heavy adventure. If your players are into that, <laughs> then I think they will enjoy this quite a bit. I was actually surprised by how, because it's level one. Like I just, you just don't, you know, how much combat can you do at level one? You don't have a whole lot of options. That was the only thing I was very concerned about. Um, but there's a part in here where it mentions, let's see, is it under? Don't think it's included here. Somewhere along the lines, it says to use um, epic, uh, the epic heroism rules, I think they're called. Where is that part? Uh, where it basically says if your players uh, choose to... Uh, it modifies the resting rule. So if your players want to short rest, it only takes five minutes. And if they long rest, it takes an hour, which means they're designed to rest a lot more often in this, which is the only way you could do a lot of combat encounters with a single, this is all basically one dungeon um, with multiple parts. And the story is you're escaping a ship that is currently under attack. You have been brought on as prisoners. There's very little like beginning action. It's like you're already as prisoners. 
Um, you've kind of resigned yourselves to your fate, and then all of a sudden the ship that you've been imprisoned on comes under attack, and you get to escape during the chaos. And it's a really cool, like, action-packed introduction. Way better than, like, you meet in a tavern, blah, 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 you know. Instead, you're all prisoners, uh, and then one of the prisoners is the former captain. The whole thing has just been, like, a mutiny, essentially. And uh, you get to escape this... Uh, ship which is really nifty at one point the like if you try to there's a path where you escape this first map and then you can choose to either go on deck two or deck three whichever one you do if you try to then go to the next deck you and it ends up being blown apart and vented into space and you have to escape and then you can make it to the final uh the hangar bay and then ultimately into a ship to escape and then uh, you get a little starship battle at the end but you can see what the maps look like here full color full detail huge thumbs up for that i appreciate the way uh, these maps are designed. I'm less enthused with some of the textures. We'll get to that later, but this one particularly looks um, nice. There is a problem here where for some reason this none of these maps include dynamic lighting, which is the first time I've ever seen that on a purchased map for Roll20. No dynamic lighting in place. It still supports dynamic lighting. It's an option I can check, but it hasn't been drawn on there. No, none of the walls have been drawn on there. I don't know if that's an error on my end. I don't know if that's an oversight. I don't know if that has something to do with the fact that Roll20 is currently, as of March 2021, like converting everything into their new dynamic lighting system. I don't know what the deal is, but as of right now on my review copy, on any of these maps, no dynamic lighting has been drawn, which is shocking to me because that seems, if you're purchasing a, a map, it should be ready to go uh, with all of the Roll20 features you know, in place. Um, and, and dynamic lighting is only available for subscribers, but obviously I'm a subscriber. And I've never seen it not uh, drawn on there and available to you. So that is a bummer. There's some weird token errors to this token right here in five is supposed to be up here in three. And there's supposed to be two guards here in five. And then they do a thing where um, the same picture is used for all these different named NPCs for the um, the leader of this uh, organization. There's like basically a generic guard stat block that's used, uh, which is this one. And then they've got these... Uh, and at commanders it's not a big deal but like at one point there's supposed to be commander colvis i believe is supposed to be the boss at the end and instead the token used is like lieutenant stool um i think they're the same so i don't think that part matters much or at least very similar but it i mean that still if you're gonna if you're gonna have separate tokens you better use the right ones like that's so there's some weird token some weird errors overall in this thing but the actual gameplay i think works pretty well there's a fun escape system here where you're fighting the guards and busting out and you can talk to the uh, you know, deposed captain lady. And then you can choose to go on map two or three. Now it says one of them is more combat oriented than the other. Uh, the players don't know that, but they can just kind of, you know, pick and choose which one. Honestly, I read through both options and they all feel very combat heavy to me. It's just, you're opening a room, you're fighting guards, you're opening a room, you're fighting guards. There might be a little bit of a different thing. One of them might, you might, might be able to interrogate like a scientist or you can rescue um, some downed, uh, what are these, the Volnas, that have currently have like a guns pointed to their head, you know, they're about to be executed for being the invading force on the ship. So you can kind of intervene in that. So there's a little bit of interesting things going on, but it's mostly just kind of a room to room uh, fight that just tries to keep up that fun uh, pacing of escaping this uh, ship that's under attack. But I just have a problem with a little bit of the art. I mean, I think the details and stuff looks good. The textures get a little muddy when you see a lot of them repeated over and over again. And it looks real bad when you get to the uh, hangar bay. This texture is straight up nasty looking, right? Uh, it looks just low res and, and weird. And you can tell it's just kind of the same splotchy areas in the same spots. It's just, this would be fine if it were a, a small, like, you know, bathroom sized room or something. But a full on hangar bay just does not, uh, the textures don't look good. But the actual, like, little assets and, and uh, details, like the chairs and the panels, all that looks fantastic. So it's not that I don't think the maps look good in general. I'm a, fan of full color maps obviously little hangar bay right here is cool looking but i don't like the uh the actual textures used but uh there's a fun little bit here where the players can choose to go to an optional area with the data processing and then that gives them access to this drone at the end which can help them in the boss battle and then it ends with them uh getting on the ship and escaping in a ship and then uh, in order to fully escape they've got to uh, survive this kind of dogfight battle with a bunch of little starships and uh you know everything's got its own stat block and uh it's all included in there in the NPC sheet. So I think it's a pretty good introductory adventure as far as adventures go. It's very combat heavy, but uh, you know, as far as level one adventures go, I think it, it, it gets the theme of of space and sci-fi pretty cool. You know, you, you're 
you're all prisoners on a ship and you have to bust out and there's laser fires going everywhere. It feels very Star Wars-y. Uh, and then you eventually escape on the ship and, and blast off and kind of survive against these starships coming after you. Uh, and you can either transition into that into the sequel or just go on your own way. There's a weird kind of epilogue footnote where it mentions, oh, and the players can't keep this ship because it's either got like a tracking system on it and they'll find it or it, it gives out on them. Like, why not just give them a ship a level one? Like, come on, that would be that would be a good excuse to give them a ship. But, oh well, <laughs> you're the damn. You could still give it to them. I would give it to them. Give them a damn ship. That's fun. Let them go on adventures. So, ultimately, mixed feelings about the whole thing, I think. Um, well, let's go over my pros and cons, and that'll be a good uh, overview of how I feel about uh, Esper Genesis in general. So, pros, it's extremely easy to teach and play, and the rules are basically identical to D&D 5e. I will include that as a pro. In terms of what they're trying to do, which is create a sci-fi conversion on top of D&D 5th edition, I think they ultimately succeeded. It works. Um, it, it just It's more a testament to 5th edition than it is to this development group, I think, um, because the rules are just very moddable and made to be able to be, you know, have those different themes stretched upon it. Um, but it doesn't screw anything up, I guess. <laughs> so that part works. Um, pros, the power list and threats database are well organized into filterable drop-down menus. That was a thing I showed earlier, which is um, just really sexy way of presenting this information that I thought was particularly uh, nice looking and, and well organized and was just a fun way of looking through all the different, um, I almost said spells, but techniques and talents. Uh, pro, concise and easy to run ship combat rules. Uh, that's something that uh, is uh, definitely a feature you want to see in all of your sci-fi RPGs is how does starship combat work, and I think this one works pretty well. Basically, just treats it like 5e combat, but you know everybody's got different roles to play. Uh, pro, the fall of the Aos Kelder intro adventure provides an exciting, action-packed level one adventure. I put that as a pro, although the some of the errors with Roll 20s conversion uh, will be included in a con. And then the pro, in intro, the adventure includes four pre-gen player characters with token art and backstories. I always want to see that on my uh, introductory adventures. Which, again, this is not an adventure like Lost Mine of Fandover, which is a full-on like mini campaign. This is an adventure more like uh, the adventure in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica or Eberron Rising, that, Rising to the Last, Rising from the Last War, which were just very quick level one. Like, hey, here's an intro, a couple scenes. And then you're probably level two after that, you know, whereas Fandover went to like level four or five. So that's the kind of content you're getting here, which isn't bad, but just know that this is not a very lengthy adventure. This is just a basically you can play over the course of probably two sessions. Uh, cons, Esper Genesis's Roll20 compendium is separate from the D&D 5e compendium, despite being fully compatible. That was the big rant I went on where you have to switch game settings in order to use these compendiums because, especially with the threat database, like, that's a bummer. Like, it would be such a huge plus if you could just seamlessly integrate all this content alongside, you know, all the monster manual creatures and easily just throw that stuff into uh, your D&D 5e. I think that would just be a huge plus for specifically the threat data because you don't really need the core manual, the Esper Genesis core manual in D&D, but the threat database could be awesome to have all these creatures in there. Uh, Con, the character romancer is not yet available for Esper Genesis. That just seems stupid at this point. Like, why not? <laughs> the character romancer is such a cool feature. Uh, it, it makes char- it, make, it makes not only creating characters easy, but leveling them up easy, keeping everything organized. That should be standard for all these different systems in Roll20, especially if you're paying for them. Uh, Con, the introductory adventure maps lack dynamic lighting, and there are some token placement errors. So that is the con side of my introductory adventure notes is the very weird oversight of not having a uh, dynamic lighting ma- uh, lines drawn in there which seems like that should be in everything i ever purchased from roll 20. uh and con this is i kind of wrapped up my main problem with desperate genesis into one negative point which is the playable races are mostly mundane humanoids and that classes and powers are too closely analogous to dungeons and dragons fifth edition like they literally have like mage armor is just protection field you know, uh, Eldritch Blast is Force Bolt. Like, it's just... It just feels too much like a knockoff than its own system. And, and I I know that that's a hard thing to do, is, hey, we want to make a 5e thing and just build things on top of what exists in 5e. That's fine. But you can still try and come up with your own stuff a little bit better instead of literally just kind of replacing things one-to-one. Obviously, there's some new stuff in there, too. But especially the main criticism for me 
I, I could have accepted all the the space spells, I think, especially because it uses talents and techniques and the spell points and things, uh, talent points. But the classes and the races really needed to be better. I honestly think they could have they could have been better. Uh, final verdict. Let's go back to the cover menu here. Uh, final verdict. Esper Genesis isn't so much built upon D and D five E as directly replaces it with a sci fi theme, creating a spacey RPG that's extremely familiar for five E fans, for better and or worse. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. And you can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.